Please open up your Bibles to the book of Acts and just place your bookmark around chapter 5. That will get you fairly close to where we're going to be through most of our lesson. And then turn to Acts 2, please. Our memory verse is on the board. This will be our first attempt at it, which is a little odd because it's the 13th of November. But this is Colossians 3, verses 20 and 21. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. It's hard to believe that we have been here a little over two years at this point. And, and as I look at my children, it becomes even harder to believe because Callie is now older than Bonnie was when we moved here. And that's just kind of one of those things that's just hard to, hard to imagine. But I really, I really mean this when I say it. I am so glad to be here. And I do mean that. I count it a privilege to get to preach the gospel. I wake up every day just blown away that I get to make my living taking the, the greatest book on the pages of any document, studying it through the week, and sharing it with the greatest people on earth. And you help me do that. I appreciate it. I really do. I love what I do. And I'm glad to be here. As I've been thinking about this concept, these these children, not just my own children, but the generations that will come of their age and the generations that will come after them. And I've thought a little bit about parenting this month and, and, and already kind of chewed on some particular lessons. I thought that this would maybe be relevant and helpful to think about this in regards to, in regards to this church. If we want the church to thrive as it ought to thrive. We need to think about the next generation because they're the ones who will take on what we leave behind them. And I think then we need to really consider this. Are we leaving a legacy for our children that they can take and, and be successful with, that they can take and then carry on to the children after them? And, and we need to consider those things because, because in many ways they are the future. They are the future of the Lord's people. So what kind of a legacy are we leaving to them? We, we think about the word thrive or, or a thriving church, and, and, and I think that sometimes in our heads we, we jump into a numbers game. Well, a thriving church is a church with large numbers, or a thriving church is, is a church that has lots of converts every year. Boy, they turn out 20, 30, 40 converts a year. That's a thriving church. Well, let's, let's just do away with that nonsense right now. Because thriving has nothing to do with numbers. Now, it might in the world, and it might in business, and it might in some, some, some denominational churches, but numbers is not what separates a thriving church from a church that is not thriving. It may surprise you that really what separates these two concepts is character traits, is qualities and so a church that is thriving has certain characteristics. It has certain qualities. A church that is not thriving does not have those same qualities or attributes or characteristics. And so here's where we need to make sure we understand the point. We get back to this discussion. Does this congregation have these characteristics? Does this congregation have these attributes? If it does, then we can say it's a thriving congregation. If it doesn't, it's not a thriving congregation. As we have kids that are getting close to graduating high school, I think this becomes a, a relevant discussion for another discussion because they're not going to be coming to Northwest with mom and dad in another year or two, are they? Because they're going to be in their own little college town and they're going to be needing to, to attend a congregation there. Can they... Can they identify a thriving congregation? Could they help encourage a congregation to thrive? 
Well, we need to think about some of these things. This gets very practical very quick. I'm not going to make an apology for this. We're going to use a lot of Bible tonight. A lot more Bible than I normally use. Is that, is that a bad thing? I don't know. That kind of, when I said it, when it came out of my mouth, it sounded like a bad thing. I think you know I try to be very biblical in what I preach, but we're going to use a lot of Bible tonight. Okay, Lots of turning, lots of reading, but I hope it will be, I hope it will be beneficial to you. The reason I have you open to Acts is because the first few chapters of Acts, we're introduced to a congregation that I, I think we can safely say is thriving. The Jerusalem congregation. Every time you turn around, this church just, it just looks awesome. It looks beautiful. It looks like it is supposed to look. But I think the danger that we need to recognize is a church can go from thriving to not thriving pretty quickly. A good example of that may be Ephesus, because in Revelation 2 and verse 4, he says, you've left your first love. Ephesus was a congregation that was thriving in the first century. I think good arguments could be made that Ephesus was kind of the springboard that opened up all of Asia Minor to the Apostle Paul. Churches and Christians started everywhere because of the work in Ephesus. What happened by Revelation 2 and verse 4? Something changed. They went from thriving to not thriving. I think the same argument could be made for the Jerusalem congregation. At some point in history, folks, they quit thriving. There's the danger. You can, you can turn it on a dime. There are three qualities that I want to point out from this congregation. Three qualities, three characteristics, three attributes that I think we need to make sure Northwest has today so that we, so that we can be a thriving congregation. Are you ready? Number one, a thriving congregation sticks to sound doctrine. Look, let's look at Acts chapter 2. Here's the beginnings. Here's the beginnings of this congregation in Jerusalem. Verse 41. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. And continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the number daily those who were being saved. Let, let's think about this. They received the word, verse 41. They were obedient to the word, verse 41. Then verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Th that word, sound doctrine, that, that's a favorite of Paul in some of the other letters we're going to look at in just a moment. It is healthy doctrine, healthy teaching. So you see, when there is a healthy teaching, by necessity there is an unhealthy teaching. It could be unbiblical things. It could be very biblical things, but it's hobby writing and it's missing the point. Well, we need to make sure we can make those distinctions in Scripture. We can see the relevancy of Scripture itself and each individual particular topic within Scripture. Folks, we've got to make sure sound doctrine, healthy teaching plays a dominant role in this church. The problem with unhealthy teaching is it creates unhealthy people. Oh, and you may think, well, I'm healthy as a, as a mule, healthy as a stray dog. That's a figure of speech. Maybe not everybody's accustomed to that one. Healthy, healthy as it gets. Well, that's great. How healthy are you spiritually? Because if all you get is unhealthy teaching spiritually, you will make an unhealthy Christian. Somebody who, who is not mature in the faith, somebody that doesn't even know the faith very well. And, and this is part of the discussion we need to make sure we have. Sound teaching begets sound living. Sound teaching begets sound Christians. If we don't get it, we get a rottenness in the soul. Let, let, let's just kind of survey one particular, well, a couple of books here. First Timothy, please. First Timothy. First Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1. Notice First Timothy chapter 1 verse 3. Paul writing to Timothy. Paul says in verse 3, I urged you when I went into Macedonia to remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. 
Notice this singularity. Scripture, doctrine, the teachings of Jesus Christ, the doctrines of faith, they are unanimous. They are one in the same. You don't deviate from it. Paul says a little further in verse 9 and following, he, he lists particular sins. At the end of verse 10, he says, if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, healthy doctrine, he says, Timothy, make sure when you're preaching at Ephesus, that you know how to combat unsound teachings. You know how to stay, say no to sin. You know how to preach against sin. If you jump down into chapter 2, in chapter 2, there is this petitions for prayers on behalf of those who lead. And he talks about the kings and all who are in authority. And in verse 3 and following, he talks about how this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved. You notice... Good, sound teaching is going to involve an appropriate viewpoint of government. Now that makes us a little bit uneasy, doesn't it? But that's precisely what he's talking about. You make sure you're praying for those who are in charge so that salvation can be the predominant feature of the faith. Make sure they're being saved. In verse 8 and following of chapter 2, he talks about propriety. He talks about the roles of unique genders. Women have roles, men have roles. Sound teaching involves addressing those things. And you, you know, it's kind of fascinating. You rewind the clock about 70 years, wouldn't have been very controversial to say genders have roles, would it? 2022? Yeah. It's a little bit more controversial all of a sudden, isn't it? You see, sound teaching will involve appropriate viewpoints of God's genders of a man and of a woman, the way God uniquely designed these figures. Even in down in chapter 3, he talks about the qualities of overseers, that is those bishops or those shepherds as they watch over the congregation. You know, it's a fascinating thing to consider. Not every church seeks to uphold the biblical pattern of elders. A thriving congregation will demand it. It will demand the preaching of these things. It will demand that we enforce these things. Let's think about how this, how this sits with parenting a little bit. Do your children know who our elders are? You see how this becomes very practical very quick? I think it was last fall. Well, you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you, Robin? Uh, last fall, Robin is teaching my girls in Bible class, and she makes a comment to them. Girls, you know our shepherds you know, our elders, and she lists them, and, and one of my girls, maybe both of my girls, said, my dad's one of the elders. And she said, no, no he's not. Oh, they got to arguing. My, you know, my girls, they weren't going to let this go. No, my dad's one of the elders. Well, here, here's the deal. I figured out, we figured out later why this happened. So once a month when the elders have their meeting, I tell the girls, girls, we're going up to the office for the elders' meeting. I didn't think to tell them I'm not one of the elders, I'm just going to the meeting. But they naturally concluded, you know, hey, we're going to the elders' meeting. Dad's going to the elders' meeting. What does that mean? Dad's one of the elders. Nope, 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 nope. I'm not one of the elders. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. A sound congregation has good shepherds, has good leaders, and thank God we have them. But you as a parent need to make sure your children know who these men are. You need to make sure you know who their wives are. Because, again, the practicality of this is when they don't feel comfortable to talk to you about something, they very well might. One of these good, godly influences. Sound congregations, a thriving congregation, is going to talk about these things. You fast forward just a little bit, and it's the same thing with deacons. Later in chapter 3, in chapter 4, he's, he's going to talk about this apostasy, this, this growing concern. In verse 6... He says, if you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. You see, sound preaching, sound teaching, something a thriving congregation will have is some of these things right here in verse 6. I'm going to demand sound, balanced teaching. You notice in verse 8 and following, there's this contrast of the physicalities versus the spiritual things of life. In verse 12 and following of chapter 4, 
He says, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word and conduct and love and spirit and faith and purity till I come. Give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. And he talks about the laying on of hands. In verse 15, he talks about how you meditate on these things. In verse 16, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. This is why we have to have sound teaching, folks. Because sound teaching helps save souls unsound teaching it destroys souls my acts class may remember this from this morning this is part part of the problem in chapter 15 with those Judaistic teachers who are trying to bind circumcision and bind the law of Moses on all of the Gentile converts this is why Paul and Barnabas confronted them in chapter 15 this is why they have the council in chapter 15 because this was an unsound teaching that could very well cost somebody a soul Folks, sound teaching, a thriving congregation that has sound teaching will demand the simplicity of the gospel message because that saves souls. You fast forward just a little bit into chapter 5 and and there's roles in the home. There's limitations of the home and the way the widows are neglected, the way the widows are helped and nourished. And in verse 16, there's, there's some balance here because the church shouldn't be burdened with unnecessary things. Sound teaching, sound preaching, we'll talk about those things as well. In chapter 5 and verse 17 and following, you have respect for those in charge, the leadership of a local church. In chapter 6, there is respect for the order and hierarchy of servants and slaves towards their masters. In verse 3 and following, boy, we love this discussion. There's a whole bunch of verses there about materialism. About money and the way we handle our money. Even down in verses 11 and following, you have this kind of interlude where he talks about fighting the good fight, being faithful and in the face of challenges and hardships. And then again in verse 17, 18, and 19, he ties right back in with money. We're Americans. We love to talk about money, don't we? You see, sound teaching, the healthy things he's talking about, he's telling Timothy about, a thriving congregation is going to talk about those things. This is not the only thing he discusses, by the way, if you just jumped into chapter, or or 2 Timothy very quickly. He talks about some of these same concepts in 2 Timothy. In chapter 1, he talks about Timothy's upbringing, and he talks about the ashamed of the gospel, or not being ashamed of the gospel, excuse me. He talks about verse 13, 2 Timothy 1 and 13, hold fast the pattern of sound words which you've heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. You think about that. Holding on to sound teaching, demanding it, supporting it. Those are things a thriving church will do. In chapter 2, he talks about the various roles of faithful people, how they teach other people so that other people can be faithful. And he uses the illustration of soldiers and he uses the illustration of farmers and runners. You've got all of these concepts tying in and out through this page. In verse 14 and 15, he again brings up the concept of unsound teaching. In verse 14, he says, Remind them of the things charging them before the Lord that they they not strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's... Folks, that's qualities of a sound congregation. That's qualities of a thriving congregation. Demanding these things. Avoiding the things like the doctrines of Hymenaeus and Philetus he goes on to talk about. Standing against those trends of our culture. Sometimes the trends of Christianity. Sometimes the trends among our own brethren. Making sure we're demanding the truth and all the truth. You go into chapter 3 and he talks about some of these same concepts, the dire circumstances in which man may find themselves. Chapter 4, verse 1. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead that is appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth, be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. You see the discussion, don't you? If we want this congregation to thrive, 
we will demand the word of God. Everybody is fine with that. Everybody is comfortable with that. Until, until we start talking about things you're doing in your life. See, it's real, it's real cute to talk about attendance when you're not a person who struggles with attendance, isn't it? It's real cute to talk about how people treat their spouse until you talk to your wife like she's a dog. It's real cute to talk about the roles between a husband and a wife until we start talking about that dirty word, submission. And by the way, that goes both ways. Submission to authority, submission to needs. Husband submits to the wife's needs, wife submits to the husband's authority. The headship in the home. You see, this gets very practical very quick. This gets very touchy very quick. It's real cute to talk about how we need to be faithful in all that we do until we start having to talk about somebody and the way they're raising their children. Folks, if we want a congregation to thrive... If we want Northwest to thrive, we will demand the whole counsel of God. Otherwise, why are we doing this? You see, this separates thriving congregations from congregations that do not thrive. By the way, you are not going to do it, but you could do this same concept right through the book of Titus because it's some of the same things. Please go back to the book of Acts. We need to make sure we see these qualities. And, and I want to tie this back into what we mo made a moment ago. As children grow up, and as they are preparing to leave the home, especially you guys with kids in middle school and high school, they're going to have to determine for themselves where they will worship one day. Do you want them to attend somewhere where it's just fun and games and frivolity? Or you want them to go somewhere where they're going to actually talk about God's Word? They're going to demand the full totality of Scripture. Remember what we just read. When Paul encouraged Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, you stick to this sound teaching stuff. Not only can it save you, but it can save those who hear you. That is a thriving congregation. Did you notice something? I didn't say one thing about, about how many members there were. You know, isn't that fascinating? You read through 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus. In fact, you just kind of read through the whole New Testament. You get little glimpses in the book of Acts as to how rapidly this movement grew. But nowhere in 1st, 2nd Timothy or Titus do you have Paul say, you know, Timothy, you know, Titus, you want to be a good congregation, a sound congregation, you've got to have X amount of members. You need to have X amount of converts every year. You don't see that. You see, it's qualities. It's attributes, it's characteristics that separate a thriving congregation from a congregation that is not thriving. Everybody with me on that? Oh, you think, well, we got through all the scripture. No, we didn't. That was some of it. All right, number, that was number one. A thriving congregation sticks to sound doctrine. Number two, a thriving congregation sticks to each other. Now, go back to the text where we began, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. You have to love these little bitty additions in the Scriptures. Verse 42, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Look at verse 44. All who believed were together and had all things in common. Verse 46, And continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. You, you see, a congregation sticks together. You know, that, that is a collective noun. It, it means there is multiple people that make it up. And so it's the same word we might use with team or assembly or church or congregation. That's what we're talking about here. These people stick together. And you can see it in the sacred. You can see it in their worship. You can see it in the simple. Because these people are together. They're working together. They're in unison with one another. We observe this a lot in my Acts class, but you'll notice it in verse 46. They continue daily with one accord. 
Very early in the book of Acts, we observe this over and over and over again, how Luke will throw in words like that to make sure you understand this is a whole new community of God's people and they are working together. Every time you turn around, they're in unison. They're striving together. They're working together. Every time it's a they. They is plural. Folks, these people stick to each other just like, just like a family does. You see, a family sticks together, doesn't it? Oh, and that's, that's the way we are. And just as a family has moments where they are very trivial, you don't ever see it from me and probably won't, but, you know, I get down on my hands and knees and wrestle and play with the girls sometimes because we're just, we're just father and, and daughters. And I play and I wrestle and we play hide and seek. We play tag and I push somebody down because that's the fun part. I'm just kidding. I got some judgy looks on that one. But you know, you know what else we do? I was kidding. I saw that. I was kidding. Mostly kidding. But you know what else we do? We sit down at the dinner table and we talk about very serious things. We talk about why we pray over a meal. We talk about God's word before bed. You see, this is the way a family works. We talk about the very simple and we talk about the very sacred. That's the way this has got to be. If we want this congregation to thrive, this is the way we interact. We talk about the very sacred, and we talk about the very simple. I've heard more than one comment in the last month, and I think this is worth sharing because I think it is commendable to you. But I've heard more than once in the, last, in the last month or so of how much this feels like family. Now, some of you folks that were born and raised around here and have blood relatives around here, you don't think about this as much. Just think for a moment, people like, well, people like me, who are eight hours from any blood relatives. When I say this is family, I mean this is family. Y'all are all I've got. I have a flat tire. I don't call my dad. Hey, Dad, you come help me with this flat tire? Oh, sure, son. I'll be there Tuesday. <laughs> you know, but, but, that's, but that's what this is. This is family. And you see this in Scripture. You see it in the passage we just read. They're, they're together and they're in fellowship with one another. They're breaking bread, the very sacred. But then they're also, they're also going from house to house and they're having those common meals because this is a family. We share together with one another. Look over in chapter 4, please. Chapter 4 and verse 32. When the body hurts... When the family hurts, it immediately springs into action to help the family. Look at verse 32. The multitude of those who believed were of one heart, here it is again, and of one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked... For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold. And they laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each as he had need. Don't you see, folks? When one of them hurts, the others rally behind them. You know, it's remarkable the way God describes his people as a body. I've got to tell you, I've hit my thumb more than one time with a hammer. And every time I do, my body reacts pretty much the same way. Ow! The, the other parts of it go to it. You know, you don't just look at it. Well, you dummy, you should have got out of the way. Just put that over to the side and forget about it. No, you, you, you recognize there's a pain here. There's something that is needed from the rest of the body to help the pain. And that's what we're seeing in chapter 4. There are those who lack, those who have needs, and the others around them they come in in a wonderful fashion to help. This is who we are, and this is what we do. Christianity is a very personal religion, and I get that. But it is a familial one, too. 
with God our Father and brothers and sisters. I want us to consider, go over to 1 Timothy 3. I know we just read parts of this passage, but I want you to see it again in a little different context. 1 Timothy chapter 3. You'll notice this is some of the, the, the reasons these terms are used in regards to our shepherds, in regards to these qualities of overseers. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetousness, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Now, Now you just think about that. Don't you see, even in that description, there are familial concepts. Because he's almost, he's like, he's like a father of a congregation. And these men who serve have very paternal qualities about them. Folks, this is a family. This is a family who seeks to serve each other. Now, you want to tie this back in with parenting? I think one of the hardest things to teach a child is to be selfless. A child is very naturally selfish. I think that that's rightfully so. When the child is hungry, the child wants food yesterday. I do remember, it's been a few years, but I certainly remember very well what would happen around 1 or 2 in the morning, pretty much every night. Somebody was waking up because somebody wanted food. Somebody wanted a diaper change. They wanted something and it was, it was selfish. That's right, they're selfish. But, but at some point, folks, we've got to make sure we're teaching these people to help serve each other. We need to do our job as parents instructing our children on how to serve the family, how to serve the brethren, because that's part of our job. In fact, this is one of the greatest things we see in Scripture. Look at Acts 11, please. Acts 11. Acts 11. At this point in the Chronicle, you have Acts depicting Paul as part of this discussion at this point. Now, in verse 27, in the days of the prophet, or in these days, Acts eleven twenty seven. 27, In these days prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. And they did it by the hands of Paul and Barnabas. Go over to Philippians 2. I want to put these two together. Philippians, the second chapter, please. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians was written some time later, probably about 10, 15 years later, in all truth. But, but I, want you, I want you to see something. What they do in Acts 11 was a very sacrificial thing. We're servants, folks. We're servants of the household of God. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul ties this in with who Christ is. Look at verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem another better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He then goes on to describe Christ going to the cross. Don't you just love that? This is who we are as God's people. We're servants to one another. We stick to each other because we're so busy serving each other. We're serving each other in spiritual things. We're serving each other in physical things. It's exactly what we just read in Acts chapter 11. People going above and beyond to see to the needs of those around them. Too many parents hide generous actions from their children. I'm not saying you need to boast about it. I'm not saying you need to flaunt it. But your kids need to see you serving Jesus Christ. they got to see that. Because you're teaching them how to do it. We've been trying to work on that at home a little bit to not a lot of success. Look for opportunities to serve those in your house because that's who you're supposed to be as a follower of Jesus Christ, a servant. From the very menial to the very serious. A thriving church sticks to each other. And then number three, a thriving church... Sticks to sharing the gospel. All right, go back to Acts chapter 3, please. Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. 
I appreciate so much Brother Bickley leading Send the Light. This is relevant here, folks. Now, I need to stress this point. I'm not saying a thriving congregation sticks to converting dozens and dozens and dozens of people every year. That's not where the success is at. The success is in sharing. Look at Acts chapter 3. As Peter and John are going into the temple complex, they come across this crippled man. And here he says, Peter in verse 6, Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, obviously, you can't do half of what that verse says. But what you can do is that first half. You may not have gold and you may not have silver, but what you do have is information about their soul. You want to see this in the book of Acts? Go back to chapter 2, verse 46. Continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the number daily those who were being saved. You want to talk about how the church exploded in growth because of activity like this? Simple daily life, folks, where they're trying to share the message of a Messiah who can save the soul. In Acts chapter 4, please over to Acts chapter 4. As the apostles here... Peter and John are taken in verse 4. Many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. That's how you share the gospel. You share the word. Leave it up to them. Go over to chapter 4, verse 31. At the conclusion of their prayer, when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And here it is. They spoke the word of God with boldness. You want to be a thriving congregation? That's got to describe us, folks. People who speak the word of God. Chapter 5, chapter 5 and verse 14. Chapter 5 and verse 14. This is after the Ananias and Sapphira event. Chapter 5, verse 14. Believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. Where are they getting this? How come so many people are coming to Christianity, folks? Because these people shared the gospel. This whole going from house to house business is where they're sharing it. Jump down to verse 42 of chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 42. Daily in the temple and every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. This is why they were a thriving congregation, because they couldn't stop talking about Jesus. I'm going to tell you, folks, we can talk about politics way too easy in our culture. We can talk about the NFL way too easy in our culture. We can talk about sports, and we can talk about the PTA, and we can talk about activities, and we can talk about vacations, but we can't talk about the soul. We want a church to thrive. We have got to get to this. Now, I didn't say. You heard me. I did not say thriving churches converting dozens and dozens of people every year. In fact, I didn't mention conversions of nothing of nobody. (laughs) Because the success is in the sharing. Folks, no place is off limits. Paul would encourage the Colossians to use wisdom in Colossians chapter 4. This congregation, as it proceeds, just continues to grow. And in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, this is where it separates. Jerusalem church is no longer the central focus. Acts chapter 8, verse 4, Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Don't you see that, folks? These people spread the word of God. As they're spreading everywhere, they're spreading the word of God. We want a congregation to thrive. That's what we're going to do. This, This message goes into Samaria. This message goes into the desert between Jerusalem and Gaza. It goes into the house of a leather man, Simon the Tanner. It goes into the Gentiles' house. Every time you turn around, these people cannot stop talking about Jesus Christ. We want a congregation to thrive. We have to share the gospel. Paul would say in in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 6 that he planted an Apollos water, but God gave the increase. I think that we need to make sure we understand that. 
the goal here, I've got to stress this, we are such a number-oriented society, but let, let's think about this. The goal is not to convert the masses. Oh, well, that would be great. I don't think anybody here would go, mm, let's stop that nonsense. No, nobody's going to do that. The goal is to be a thriving congregation. We already naturally do many of these things because we are so family-oriented in this church. I think this congregation is a thriving congregation. If I didn't, I would not have said how glad I am to be here after two years. I probably would have just said I've been here for two years and I can't wait to move. No, I, but I think this is a thriving congregation. The danger is a church can go from thriving to not thriving like that. So what are we going to do? Will we choose to take up the, the, the work before us to continue to strive about these things? We must, folks, and let me tell you why. We've got kids in this auditorium tonight. What are we going to leave with them? I know every parent has that on their mind. I'm scared to death for my kids. We're leaving it for them. Are we going to help them? Or are we going to leave them in the wind? Maybe there's somebody here tonight who, who needs the prayers of this congregation, who, who needs to respond to the gospel, who's not a Christian. Well, whatever your need may be, we would ask you to make it known to us now as we stand and as we sing.